Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for the discussion and reflections on racism in the United States Criminal Justice System panel, hosted by FIU Law and the Florida Center for Capital Representation. We are recording today's panel and we'll let you know when it is available on demand. We will be addressing your questions throughout tonight's talk. You can submit your questions during the discussion using the Q&A function of the webinar. We will, get, we will do our very best to get every single one of your questions answered. In the event we do not get to one, we will submit them to the speakers for a follow-up. Resources and other announcements will be placed in the chat function. You can make this presentation full screen by clicking on the four arrows icon in the top right corner. To return, you can click the same arrow icon again. Now with those housekeeping items out of the way, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Anthony Page, the Dean of FIU College of Law. Thank you very much, Michelle. As she said, I'm Anthony Page, and I'm gonna add that I am very privileged and honored to be the Dean of FIU Law, South Florida's public law school. Thank you so much for joining us for today's panel discussion on racism in the US criminal justice system. It is of course very timely in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and the resulting unrest. If you're interested, you can find on our website recording of several panels on the subject including not just the law, but reflections on allyship and another one on what FIU law grads are doing. The college Uh, we seem to have lost you for a minute, but Anthony, it looks like you are back. I'm so sorry. Uh, there's a storm going on and the internet is unreliable. Now, I'm confident, even if you haven't seen the movie Just Mercy, you will find this a fascinating conversation. I do recommend, however, watch the movie. I did, and then I also made my children watch it. And afterwards, and I tell you, I don't think this has ever happened before, they thanked me for making them watch. Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times wrote, it's a searing and soaring, and it will start a million conversations in the country about the death penalty, about racial justice, and about how poor Americans routinely get a third class justice system. And it certainly did this in my family, and I really do encourage you to watch it. Now, just before we get started, I would like to recognize Stephen Harper. Stephen Harper is the director of FIU Law's Center for Capital Representation. And uh, I realized he was at a faculty meeting today and I realized that this was his last faculty meeting as he is retiring after years and years of dedicated service. So uh, I'm not sure if you're there, Stephen, but in any case, thank you very much for all of those years of service. For this event, I'd also like to recognize the Global Forensic and Justice Center, and especially Michelle Chernikoff for her work in putting this event together. And I would also would like to recognize FIU Law's own Hannah Gorman for all of her work as well, coordinating the event. At this point, let me turn it over to our wonderful moderator, Professor and Judge Phyllis Cote. Good evening. It really is a pleasure to be here, albeit under these circumstances of such a serious and, and um, tremendous uh, subject for us to discuss. Brian Stevenson said that the death penalty is not whether people deserve to die from the crimes they commit, but the real question of capital punishment in this country is do we deserve to kill? 
And that really is the question. And he further posits that the death penalty symbolizes whom we fear and don't fear and whom we care about and whose lives are not valid. The Florida Center for Capital Representation, which is also one of the sponsors of this program today, was founded in 2014 to assist defense attorneys with death penalty cases. They provide cutting edge legal and investigative assistance direct mitigation and defense victim outreach services, empirical research, training, and wonderful programs like we're here today. With a focus on mitigation and restorative justice, their priorities have included juveniles charged as adults, foreign nationals, those facing severe penalties, death, and life without parole. As we begin today, the first question that we'd like to pull all of you with um, and we'll, we'll, we'll pull up our first poll is, do you believe in the death penalty? So the poll question is, I believe the death penalty is A, appropriate in all premeditated murder cases, second choice appropriate in some pre premeditated murder cases, and the third choice never appropriate. If you look on the bottom of your screen, I think it gives you a chance to be able to, to record your answer. I'll give it about 10 more seconds here. We've got a pretty good response coming in. Excellent. And if you see the screen, you, get, you see a look at our results. So we kind of know who the audience is uh, to whom we're talking today. And we thank you for participation. There'll be other opportunities for you to participate. So we really want to remind you that this is not about just listening to talking heads, but giving you an opportunity to ask us questions and to give your own opinions about the death penalty and the movie Just Mercy. In the film Just Mercy, it provocatively beckons us all to confront the unjust nature of our criminal justice system. It opens up a critical discussion for us to rethink incarceration and the death penalty. The film provides a sobering glimpse into how race and class can provide systematic fuel for the systemic failings of a criminal justice system that results in wrongful incarceration and wrongful imp imposition of the death penalty. We have the opportunity today to confront the criminal justice institutions, its key players, the criminal justice survivors of wrongful incarceration, as we discuss the impactful film that chronicles the life of the failings of our criminal justice system. Our panelists will help us survey the work of organizations and people in the fight to address critical issues about the issues raised by the movie, Just Mercy. They will also help us identify and debate the cha changes that are needed to address this critical issue that we see and that has been raised. And ultimately, we will see a face that personifies some of the critical issues that cannot be ignored in a discussion of our criminal justice system. I want to open our discussion with an introduction of our speakers and an opening statement from them that reflects on issues that are addressed in the movie. Hannah Gorman is the Deputy Director of the Florida Center for Capital Representation here at Florida International University. She's a Florida Mitigation Specialist and licensed to practice law both in the United Kingdom and New York. She also co-teaches the death penalty module of our clinic here at FIU and specializes on topics of international human rights and violations of the law. Herman Lindsay in 2009 became the 135th person to be exonerated from the death row since the death penalty was reinstated in the United States. He was the 23rd person to be exonerated from Florida's death row. Florida has the highest rate of exonerations from death row of any other state in the nation. He's on the board of witness to Innocent, which is the nation's only organization 
dedicated to empowering exonerated death row survivors to be powerful and effective voices in the struggle to end the death penalty in the United States. Heather. So Hannah. Hi everybody, uh, thank you very much for joining us and thank you Phyllis for moderating and Dean Page for giving us the introduction. And of course, Herman, very glad to be on the panel with you. Uh, I think my, my opening statement, um, in addition to the thanks to everybody for your interest, is to focus on the people. Um, and they are the reason why I first got involved um, in this type of work. So what I thought I would do is just really share a, an insight as to why I just happen to be here right now talking to you about these issues. Um, and of course, it's because I'm at FIU and we're in the center. Um, but the reason that brought me to the work was because I watched a documentary. Um, and that was around the age of 13, which was many moons ago now. Um, but I think what's powerful about that for me is watching that documentary when I was age 13 uh, led me to begin to write to somebody who was on death row because at the time that was the only thing I could do that I thought was worthwhile being just 13. Um, some people have laughed and joked that children that age would be better off writing letters to your boy band fan club or um, one of those foreign pen pals you used to get in the back of the magazines. Um, but no, that's what I chose to do. Um, I don't know how my mom let me do it, but I am very glad she did. Because what formed was a friendship and a source of knowledge to an entirely different world that I did not understand. And it goes back to that documentary because without me watching that, I would not have been exposed to go further, to start speaking to more people. Um, and although it's an entire coincidence, um, my pen pal uh, was um, from Florida. Uh, that's not the reason why I'm here, but it's funny. I don't know whether there's some divine intervention. I've done work in lots of different states, but this is where I am right now. And I do feel that it's the right place for me to be. So I mention it because it's the power of film and it's the power of a documentary. And Just Mercy has really told a story. Um, it's another story. We've seen many, many cases with very similar factors. Um, and indeed, at the center, I suppose what Just Mercy portrays is what we see every day. So that would be my opening statement is the power of somebody's story and everybody has a story to tell. And leaving us with one of my favorite quotes from Brian Stevenson is, um, each of us are better than the worst thing we have ever done. Mm -hmm. And that's the story that we tell at the center for Florida Capital representation. Absolutely, thanks Hannah and Herman. I would just like to say I'm thankful uh, to be here because, uh, you know, I don't just fight because I was exonerated from death row. I fight because it's, it's a passion that has developed in me to see, um, to try to preserve life. You know, it's a lot of people on death row that is just ex extremely outstanding people. And uh, I don't think they deserve to die. And I don't believe that a uh, man should have the power to decide who lives and die. And I love the fact that I'm working with FIU. Hannah brought me out of hamburgers, so I'm here today. So, you know, uh, but the, the greatest thing of being here today is that I didn't receive any compensation, but seeing the people that is, is our future, taking uh, initiative to actually participate in this educational program and learning about these issues that we have at hand, it gives me hope that, you know, in the future, no man will have to suffer what I went through. You know, it's, we have potential jurors in front of us. We have potential judges and uh, state attorneys and uh, uh, defense attorney, and they will learn the importance of how to defend a, a, and, um, a, a, 
and the importance of regards to a person life is not just a person because he convicted of a felony that you know he's he's nobody he's nothing you know it's 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 the hopes that of change and i think this is where change began with the youth and the younger people and people actually being educated of what's going on and coming forth right. Thanks, Herman. I think one of the interesting things is when Hannah started talking, she talked about the very personal experience for her that kind of sparked this interest in the subject of the death penalty. And for, for us, Herman, you put a face on the death penalty. You put a face on exoneration. You put a face on innocence. And it's very important, I, I think, as we, certainly as you strive to, to have the death penalty abolished, as we all strive to have meaningful uh, dialogues about the death penalty and the viability of it, um, we need to know and understand that we're talking about people, that we are talking about human beings. We're talking about people, for me, that could be my brother, my son, uh, you know, a, a partner. So, so it is very important for us to know and understand. So our second poll question, I think, ties to this, and, and then we'll, we'll, I'll ask you all a couple more, and it's how many people do you think are on Florida's death row? How many people do you think are on Florida's death row? Your choices, they are 32, 177, 219, 348, 727. Tell them when they pick in the question, the mine is me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they count you out. Okay, hey, Phyllis, I'm going to give about five more seconds here. We are getting a lot of great response, and I really appreciate everyone's participation in these polls. Thank you. This is really interesting. We're dealing, I think it shows the level of knowledge that we're dealing with, but, but certainly given the variations in terms of what we're looking at, um, we see the numbers. So the correct answer here is 348. Right. And most of us got it, but there, there's a split and, and it certainly is understandable. I think those of you who, who chose 32, probably like myself or don't want to believe that we have so many people that, that are waiting and on death row here in Florida. And, and certainly hearing a number like 727, you think about the fact that we said our numbers are so high here in Florida. So Hannah, I wanted to ask, how is your work with the FCCR uh, related uh, to or informed by the work that we saw Brian Stevenson and the, the, e the Equal Justice Institute doing? Uh, great question. Thanks, Phyllis. Um, so I think the first place for me to start with that is what we do at the center um, is very similar to what you see in the movie um, with Brian and his work. Uh, so what we're doing is, is working, um, providing legal and investigative assistance on cases. Um, Sometimes for free, and then in a very small amount of cases, we uh, are appointed directly by the court. So the court pays um, for us to do that work. But we also do other pro bono work in the form of empirical evidence and research uh, that we provide and supplement to the lawyers and also to you guys. So we have this type of information. So we just did this poll on death row. Um, we go beyond that and have a lot more data and statistics um, on what's happening on the ground and how Florida is applying it. So aside from doing similar work to Brian, although we don't have federal funding, but we do have what Brian didn't in those days when he started out, the support of FIU, which is yeah. incredible and, and amazing um, and matters very much so. So we get some other funds from uh, charitable grants um, and um, we 
have desk space, etc. access to legal databases to help us with our work, access to experts across FIU and all different disciplines that you may need to utilize as part of a case. Um, but going back to your question there, Phyllis, I think, so what does that mean, right? Like, well, in the movie, the issues are the same. It tells the story, for me, the same stuff we see day in, day in now. The issues with not just the death penalty, but the criminal justice system as a whole. Um, I, I mean, in terms of, <laughs> of Herman <laughs> being here and joining us with his own entire story that is almost identical to Walter's. Mm -hmm. And then Anthony Rinton, who is, is Anthony is the character you remember who gets out later on right. and proven innocent. Um, so I think, first of all, wrongful conviction and innocence is what we see day in, day out. Um, just a sidebar, which we won't run a poll on, poll on, but FYI, Florida has the highest number of death row exonerations in the nation, accounting for 20% of them. And Herman will obviously pick up on that more. Um, mental illness that we see in Herbie's character. Um, for those of you um, that need a little memory jog, Herb Herbie was the guy with post-traumatic stress disorder and the right. bomb who was executed. Um, so mental illness is a huge issue that we see day in, day out. Uh, racism, intentional, implicit, institutional racism. Uh, we also see a focus um, on those who are poor. Poverty plays a huge role um, in the way that the death penalty is applied for us. And what we also see is the role of politics. You see that in Just Mercy too, from the judges, to the state attorneys, to the sheriff. Um, and, and remember at the end, we have a number of those captions, right, that tell us how long they stay in term. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out that I think Sheriff Tom, Tommy Sheriff, I think it was Sheriff, Tom Tate, the Sheriff Tate, yeah. Tate Sheriff Tate, he, he stayed um, despite Walter's story and the uncovering of that. Absolutely. He stayed in Absolutely. his position, right? Yeah. Um, which I just find amazing. But I also believe, and please, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm correct in thinking that the reason for that was also that he ran unopposed. So, you know. But even he, running at a, unopposed, it sends a message, though. Yeah, where this outrage is like, where is the outrage that someone would want to run against him? And isn't that, isn't that a massive, for me, that's a massive wall of silence because why many of us only now know Walter's story, thank goodness to Hollywood coming in to tell it. Um, you know, the, the reality is, is people did know that story and people in positions of right. power. Right, And right. we could have done something about that. And that's something... I, I don't understand and I think that's something that we are tackling now and I think that's something why we see the protests with George Floyd, the anger and frustration that to those who could have made a difference, who are in power to make a difference, not doing it. Um, so, so and, and many other issues more, right? The money, mm -hmm. for example, we were talking about, uh, I mentioned poverty, but that relates to the cost of a lawyer and it also relates to the costs of the death penalty, it is very resource intensive to litigate a death penalty case. And current cost studies, again, I'm throwing some stats at you guys, forgive me, but we have figures, California did a cost study, they, uh, they went into $4 billion right. being the cost for their death penalty since they reinstated it in 78. Some other estimates for Florida, the best we have right now, there hasn't haven't been a substantial cost study. We hope to do one one day. Um, suggest that the cost of a death penalty case, uh, based on those who have already been executed and analyzing how much all those cases cost, it was 24 million per case. So when you take that into account, into the arguments of the death penalty, I think that's a pretty powerful one for those who perhaps don't morally disagree, but on good common sense and business. Absolutely. So, so Herman, I want to ask you, I mean, certainly when, when one is, is freed, I mean, they, they have no money, no housing, no transportation, no health services, no insurance, and in many cases, no support system, and a criminal justice system that's not in a hurry to 
to expunge their record or, or create or um, uh, correct the impression um, that this person is a convicted felon of that crime. So my question to you is, do you think that states have a, a responsibility to restore the lives of the wrongfully convicted to the best of, of, of their abilities? I wish it was that way, actually I do. Instead, um, <clears throat> one thing about the state of Florida, uh, I don't think the state of Florida is, it has moved towards being a state of rehabilitation now being a state of uh, political gain. Uh, the prison system is one of the number one industries in the state of Florida. Uh, so they're, they're, I don't think they're, they're trying to rehabilitate people into society. One, and we're not, we're not talking about just death penalty cases, but we're talking about people, anybody that commits a felony. As for me, <clears throat> I think it's diff more difficult for me than most because I have such a high um, crime on my record that I did not commit. And even though I did not commit it, you know, I, I have to pay a, a, a price a price for it. You know, um, when I was exonerated, I came home. They they didn't uh, they didn't give me any help or or, or any compensation. In fact, we've been fighting ten years now to try to get the compensation bill changed, and I still haven't been able to 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 apply for that. Or because you'll um, need a legislature um, to help you, right? It takes a legislative. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so beyond that conversation, no, no conversation, you, once you exonerate it, you, you have to, here in the state of Florida, you have to start living a, a life sentence. And what I call a life sentence, uh, normally things are very difficult in life, but if you have like a drug charge or something like that, you know, it, it, uh, somebody may give you a chance for a job. But when you are being accused of a murder, Nobody want to be affiliated with you. So that affects the, the background checks come in when you're trying to um, seek employment, when you're trying to um, uh, rent a resident. And, and you know, the, the most craziest thing is a couple of months ago, I applied for uh, life insurance because I got married. I wanted my wife and kids. This, I wanted to set up a plan. I got denied because of the murder. But the most funniest thing, just last week, I went to Tampa for a photo shoot with uh, National Geographic and uh, Disney, and I tried to rent an Airbnb. They denied me an Airbnb account and sent back my whole criminal record. I, I got it on my computer right now, my whole criminal record. I have not had a conviction since 1998, but all of that stuff from the time I was first got in trouble to right. now, is showing up. And and the thing about it is the murder is showing up as the recent one on the background check. And it don't shows that I was found innocent. Right. You know, and it's a conviction adjudicated, you know, and and it, it is very difficult when I'm trying to do things. Even banks now are doing criminal background check and that murder comes up. And I wish that the state of Florida would say, okay, we made this mistake. Right. Let's go ahead and let's at least take it off his record for him. Right. But unfortunately, they don't work like that. And in fact, some prosecutors in some of the death penalty cases, um, when a person been exonerated, they still claim that the person was the one that committed the crime. They just couldn't yeah. prove it. You know, you go through so much. And um, I just wish the state would take responsibility and say, hey, okay, we wrong. We, we got it wrong. Let's, uh, at least we can do is take this off so that you can try to rehabilitate your life. Right, right. I, I hear we have a lot of questions waiting and I have some questions here, but I'd rather go to the questions of the people we have out there because I think it is so, so important. You know, I, I, I just keep thinking, you know, Herman, as you're talking, I think back to, you know, slavery when we had to have these papers in order to, to, to prove who we were and that we deserve to be there. And it's almost like you, you need to have papers to say, look, I was exonerated from this. I'm innocent. Get you know, and, and it, 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 it it must be. It's frustrating for me to hear. So I can only imagine how frustrating it must be for you to live that. It's quite frustrating. You know, it's it's times I still have to bring it up on the uh, Google it on my phone to show the officer 
you know, sometimes when I get pulled by the police, you know, it's, it's still showing that I'm out on conditional release for murder. And uh, conditional release for most people don't know is like parole, probation. Right. When instead of saying I was just exonerated of it, so I have to show them to them. And then uh, once people get, really see the paper, sometimes a lot of people change. Some people are questionable. But the fact still is intact that it's like it's the most difficult thing in your life that you have to suffer. First of all, uh, uh, you, 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 uh, it's hard for me to even believe that I got convicted for something I didn't do, and then turn around and and you know, uh, I mean, it, 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 the life I have to live. And I just want to point this out. You know, if if you notice in the movie, you know, Walter uh, was trying to 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 when they was about to release him, he had all the people there. He had all the support there. You know, you see at the end that Brian had to go in front of a committee and try to fight for you for, to clear his name. Well, we don't have that process here in the state of Florida. We don't have the process where we can go in front. Instead, matter of fact, the, the, the compensation bill that's intact right now says that we have to go, in order to meet the, the criteria for the uh, compensation, we have to go into a hearing like that and prove that we are innocent. Wow. in order to get the compensation. But we don't have a, a hearing that we just go in there and say, okay, can we do the paperwork to show that this person was innocent, released uh, all, all things attached to that to him. But unfortunately, the, the state don't have that. And I think they also look at if you have other criminal history as well. Yes, well, well we got past that. Uh, last, In fact, last year, it was called the Clean Hand Act. When I right. first was released, um, they would they if you had a prior convicted felon, you know you you don't uh, meet the criteria for compensation for wrong conviction. That's basically because here in our society in in in, in the police investigation work, the, if you look at the people that's mostly been wrongfully convicted, they had a, a prior convicted felon, which makes it a, a, a much easier for the state because some of the times society look at a person as as they're convicted felony that they are, are completely bad people when they don't understand, you know, uh, they're good people. And that's why sometimes when I speak, I like to go around people without introducing myself or telling them I'm the speaker here or who I am and let them get a feel of that, hey, I'm just a normal person like anybody else, you know. All right, so um, our questions, did you have our questions, Michelle? Yes. Um, so I appreciate everyone's uh, very thoughtful questions. Um, the first one is for Hannah. Uh, Nick wants to know what was the name of the documentary that you watched when you were 13? It was 14 Days in May. And it was the, it was a BBC documentary uh, that tracked the last 14 days of Edward Earl Johnson in Mississippi, Parchman, Mississippi. Excellent. Now I'll have to check that out. Um, and another one for Hannah. Uh, do you still see that much backlash from the community when you go to help exonerate death row inmates? Um, I'm assuming by backlash, you mean community disapproval of what we do, perhaps in a similar way to Brian when, when he was trying to rent an office. Um, I'm assuming that's what you mean, but shout uh, if it's wrong. Do we get backlash? It's a really good question. Um, it depends where you are, is my answer. Um, I can tell you that when I used to do this work out of a charity with headquarters in London, it was a very different, uh, different experience being around, um, in fact, I have, I, I have an image that I'm going to show you at some point at a good time, I won't do it now, but uh, Europe and the EU, membership of the EU requires that state to have abolished the death penalty. So very different attitude when doing work out of Europe or alongside European governments on, um, on, on policies, etc., around international human rights work. I can tell you that when I first started um, doing this work, which was thanks to a charity called Amicus. Um, they, they sent me to Mississippi. Again, funny little coincidences given the documentary was in Mississippi too. Um, they sent me to Mississippi, which was my ex first experience of death row. And if you like 
you know, that, that experience that you see in the movie of Brian as a little wee intern, sort of fumbling through his words, that, that was me there. Um, and I think sort of the training that Amicus gave me <laughs> was perfect and bang on because it was advice on how to deal with, for example, in a social setting, um, when everybody at the bar is very pro death penalty. Um, and I can tell you that I still go to bars now where I won't, you know, if somebody asks what I do, I don't openly say it just to save a debate. Sometimes I say it loud and proud to create one, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think more and more now because the commentary is already there for me. So the answer to that is, is yes, there is a backlash, but I have also gained a lot of support. I think over the years. So I, I think there's a bunch of people who've got a lot to say. And I, for one, talk about timing of this webinar um, and the documentary, uh, sorry, the film being out uh, at the time of George Floyd and all of these protests, you know, that's the community speaking. Um, so there's a lot of support for it now too. And where can we find the statistical data of death row? Would we be able to find the same data across the nation or are only some states transparent in this information? Well, I wonder whether I, I have a couple of images that I'd like to show you. First of all, um, the first answer is this, there is wonderful, wonderful information on the Death Penalty Information Center. So if you want information pretty much on what states have the death penalty, what states don't, uh, that's 25 that still do and retain it. Um, you can find pretty much every stat you're after. If you want Florida data, um, I referred to some of our empirical evidence. So we go above and beyond what the Death Penalty Information Center does and we work with them to provide more data to them on what's happening in Florida. Um, so if everybody will just indulge me, I'm gonna show you a, a couple of these charts. Um, so the answers though, in short, a death penalty information center, Amnesty International reports every year, um, NAACP Legal mm -hmm. Fund does a report on the death penalty every year. Uh, so let me just, I'm gonna share my screen if that's all right folks. And also I will just say, before I do that, if you'd permit me, um, I'm going to do it anyway until Phyllis like cuts my mic or something. So just going back to that poll that we asked, um, I thought it, it would be interesting just to let you know that Florida is the largest death row, active death row in the nation. Um, and that's behind California, whose statistics I did include in that poll question for you. They were the 727. But the reason why we're not so worried about California anymore is the governor announced a moratorium and not only did he do that whilst he was announcing that he actually had the equipment for the lethal injection pulled out of the prison so <laughs> if should anybody else come in in his place they're going to have to do some hard work to put that equipment back in so behind california and having removed it because of its moratorium florida is the most active largest death row state um, just to give you some comparison, the 32 was Arkansas, the 177 figure was Alabama, and Texas was uh, the 219 figure. So that gives you an idea of where Florida fares, right, on the national uh, platform. But also were number two in terms of ranking for execution. And all of the sources of this can be found on the Death Penalty Information Center. Uh, different sources and different studies, but that's the way to go to see them. Um, we last year had the highest record for sentencing people to death. So we led the nation in how many people we've sentenced to death. Um, and that's been a pattern over the last few years, but certainly uh, in 2019. And then in addition to all of that, uh, there's the innocence exonerations being the highest that I mentioned before. And of course, what I haven't yet mentioned um, is in the last four years, four or five years, um, Florida's death penalty has been twice held unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. So we have some issues in the way we are applying it and people, the law is recognizing it. Now what that has created, and perhaps this is for another discussion or if you guys wanna know more, I rely on you to ask the questions. Um, but what it means is, is we've had a very 
unstable period over the last four to five years as a result of these decisions, including a, a stay of all proceedings of around about 18 months, including a stay of executions for 18 months, whilst Florida ran and scrambled to put together the new law. Um, we had one case that went ahead, even though we didn't have a death penalty statute in place, which is incredible. And of course, that case is now back from an appeal because, well, quite frankly, if you'll forgive me, that judge was foolish not to know that there wasn't a current death penalty statute <laughs> and to sentence somebody to death under their own law. Uh, so I am just going to share these screens. Please bear with me, folks, because I'm... How are you doing that, Hannah? I want to ask you, because yeah. in Arkansas, I know their numbers are low, but wasn't it in Arkansas where they actually tried to execute eight people in eight days? Yes, it was. And I understand that they, well, first of all, they weren't successful in doing that. Although they got a... Arkansas executions is because Arkansas hadn't executed for, I believe, nearly a decade, um, but a, a good amount of years. Um, and that impacted directly the United States um, positioning in terms of executions. Uh, so here what you see is in the world rankings of execution, and this source is Amnesty International, um, you will see that the US is in the seventh place globally. And you can see behind China, Iran, Saudi, Vietnam, Iraq, and Egypt. Now, of course, Arkansas um, added to those. So as we're seeing executions rise, we're going to probably see the US's ranking as number seven rise also. Um, and that is also um, likely to be the case when we've just seen federal executions resume after 17 years with three people being executed in the last week. Um, I mention this because for the first time in 10 years, the US dropped down two places. So it used to be consistently number five. Um, so that gives you an idea of where it sits on the international platform. And of course, this is uh, an old, image but it's one of my favorite images that amnesty has ever ever used um, and it's because i think it really clearly shows uh what portion of the world uh, in a great graphic um is still using the death penalty actively and again there's different definitions and depending on the definition of how many countries there are in the world which i'm going to go with the un 196 um I understand that the latest number is 143 of uh, abolish the death penalty. So rough maths on my part, but 75% of the world essentially has either abolished the death penalty off their books entirely or have not executed somebody for over a decade. So their practice per se is, is abolitionist de facto. So I think that's good to put the US on an understanding. And then if you take into the account the information that we know about Florida's use of the death penalty, we can quite simply say that Florida is one of the worst death penalty jurisdictions or highest or death friendly or whatever phrase you want to use in the world. Because the reality is, is I mean, 22 states in the US don't have the death penalty. So this map is a little bit uh, non-representative in that sense because it doesn't count uh, which states are, are active. And just because we're here, and then I promise um, I will stop flashing up uh, charts to you all, but I thought you would appreciate seeing this one. What this is, uh, they, these are my stats. Um, for those that, that like me to source everything, this is um, a result of reading a case, which was the last time the U.S. considered, an, uh, the U.S. being the United States Supreme Court, considered the uh, death penalty under an Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual violation. Uh, and that was not per se, it was in the context of 
uh, the lethal injection arguments. But when they did that, what became clear from numerous studies cited in Glossop and Gross is the, is the case if anybody wants it, um, was that 90% of death sentences came out of around 2% of counties across the US, which is pretty, pretty incredible. If you're looking at and applying and analyzing arguments of what is unusual when you look that so few, uh, the majority of the sentences are coming from so few an area. And even more so when we then consider, well, what's happening in those areas and why might that be? Is it that there's a huge murder rate? There's lots more crimes? Is it that it's a, uh, a large city like Miami, uh, where there's lots of people and a large population that would explain it. And um, so what I did was, was uh, basically populate um, the death sentences and take into account per capita and also homicide rates. And this is what we get in terms of the geographical variance of death sentences. Now it's a 10 year period, but what this shows is that in terms of judicial circuits of which we have 20 in Florida and 67 counties. And without getting into that too much, the reason why I look at the judicial circuits is because that's where a state attorney is elected. Um, so that's where our public defenders are elected. Sometimes you can just have one county like Miami in the 11th circuit, or you can have three in the fourth circuit, which includes Duval and Jacksonville. Um, and you can see here, this is actually Duval. And Duval in itself accounted for 25% of all the death sentences coming out of Florida. So I can go crazy on all the stats, but I won't. I think the takeaway from this is look at this massive geographical variance, which we know cannot be explained by population or homicide rate. What I can't tell you is what it is explained by. I can guess, um, but we don't have the statistical significance in terms of our empirical research done and dusted yet. Um, so maybe more on that, but what I can tell you is certainly one reason is likely to be connected to who is in office as a state attorney, because they are the ones that make the decision on whether to seek the death penalty, um, albeit guided by a very wide, huge number of aggravators in the legal death penalty statute. And just to show you, their discretion also varies too, and these are the circuits. So again, the takeaway is, is don't worry about the numbers too much, but this is the ratio of cases that would be eligible for the death penalty, and then who actually sought the death penalty. And you can see we're all over, all over the show there. Um, I'm done with my, my graphical analysis, Phyllis, so thank you for letting me get through it. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer how I got them, what we did, et cetera. I was, I was able to find the question and answer. I'm always um, intrigued by, by technology because I never understand it. So Herman, I think this is a question not only that, that, that you can, can, can give us some insight about, but that we also saw kind of dealt with in the movie. It says, is the majority of the work solely legal procedural issues based on uh, based issues, or do you frequently encounter other aspects uh, such as flawed forensic evidence? And I ask that because the quality of the evidence or lack of thereof um, it is a major thing that people really don't understand. That that we 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 have it, of course, where people make up evidence or or mm -hmm. perjured evidence, but the sufficiency of the evidence or the lack of the evidence itself. It's not a procedural thing. I mean, it's about the quality. So, I mean, what insight can you give us in terms of, 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 of issues as they relate to evidence um, and the sufficiency or kind of evidence that's used, Herman? Uh, you, you have to forgive me when I attack this question. Uh, okay. You know, I, I think it's very important that people understand that uh, one of the major problems in our justice system is the fact that uh, a lot of people don't want to be on the jury. The uh, jury duty, you know, the state can present, it every day. The state can present all the evidence they want. If the evidence is not significant enough or whatever, it's up for the jury to decide. And half of the time, the jury do not pay attention to the evidence or hold Absolutely. the state showing what the evidence uh, strength is and the connection, you know. Um, I, I, I always uh, ask the question, how many people uh, 
believe that our justice system has wrongfully convicted anyone or sentenced them to death. And right. everybody raised their hands and they say they yeah, have, but actually in reality, it's the jury. You know, right. it, it's like, when the state is prosecuted, is short, uh, the, when the prosecutors present their case, they look. Most of the society again will go back to uh, what I was saying before because society look at a person as uh, a convicted felon that he's the bad person. They feel like the state got the right man, you know, at, at all times. And, and, and CSI always the criminal minds always show they got the right person. They don't Absolutely. show when they done made the mistakes, and Absolutely. that's what happens. And so when the jury, when you on the jury and you're not questioning this evidence and you're not looking at this evidence and the possibility and don't understand what beyond a reasonable doubt is, we're going to always have wrongful convictions. The evidence that is presented, you know, it, it, it's very difficult in the courtroom to say what has been altered, what has not been altered. You know, and, and, and it's, it's, we have plenty of cases where the state and uh, the state and um, detectives done held back evidence that you didn't see, or right. you know, evidence that's been been, been tainted and, and and planted or anything. It's hard for the jury to determine that because they don't know of that. But as people educating themselves about things that are really going on, that that makes them ask that question now to to the the, the sufficiency of that evidence. And that's what um, I have to say about evidence because, you know, evidence is presented in a lot of cases and in a lot of exonerations that evidence was presented was tainted or it was... And, and let's talk about that because it, it, so, it, you raise a great point. What about the prosecutor who holds that evidence? I mean, I know for a fact that there are ethical rules that require prosecutors to bring forth evidence if it suggests that the person didn't do it. I mean, what do you think should be done to prosecutors, Herman, who, who participate in, 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 the, in this matter? And see, that's the thing. Uh, prosecutors are immune to, to, um, to prosecution, or you don't really see prosecutors getting taken down and sentenced to jail or arrested for something they do. Why they have so much power, I don't know, but it's been abused over the years. And that is what, if you look at the good old boy system, that's where the connections always start in the state attorney's office. Let's, and, and this also addressed something I wanted to say something about the black, the backlash. The backlash comes from society. I mean, because of uh, society reaction. If you look at it, and, and all this is entwined together, the state attorney office was the key office in, Walt, in Just Mercy and Walter McNeil and Case. Right. It had... He was, didn't want anybody to touch it, even though he wasn't there. It was way, a prosecutor way before him. He just re, been elected. He want to do what justice the society think is uh, justice because the society seen a, a horrendous uh, uh, murder and they wanted to, you know, uh, leave it a hush hush and leave the community alone. But they never presented justice to the, the, the society. Now, once the state attorney was at the beginning was a part of this good old boy system, covering up for the sheriff, covering up for the judge, keeping everything away. But once they see society, the people of the community steps up and show an interest in this case, then that good old boy system got broken down and the state attorney, he had a choice. He either gonna pick the side way over here with the with the sheriff or he gonna pick with the communities who were elected him. So he decided- but That was the third one though. It took three state attorneys to do the right thing. Exactly. But see, that's the thing. When did the community, the, the, the whole key thing is society and the community stepped up together. And Absolutely. that's what it has to happen when we got wrongfully conviction and the state attorneys are messing up. The community and the society is going to take them to step up and come and complain as, 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 a, as a unity. You know, that's what's going to have to happen to get one of these state attorneys in, in a position where they have to be woken up. Because other than that, they are immune, but they are elected officials. And if this community steps up and they see it's a problem, guess what? An investigation will be going on, uh, uh, going on to them. I mean, look at what the change is being made right now with the police department and, and things like that. It's all because the, the community showed 
that we're outraged with this. We're not going to put up with this. Hey, we should have been, I'm in Broward County. We should have been got rid of Michael Sachs, you know, but <laughs> hey, it, it, it never came for it. But in order, if they're immune to, 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 um, if they are immune to any uh, punishment or anything, how right. do you get them to pay? Yeah, society has to step up together and we got to say, hey, we need him removed or something. We got too many exonerations coming out of it, too many problems, too many prosecutor misconduct, something in this need to change. And it well, all- You know, and, and, I, and I agree with you, but yeah, did you see what happened in Jackson, and not Jacksonville, it was Orlando when the new state attorney came in and tried to abolish the death penalty and the governor in the community went after her when she said, you know, we need to look at this. There's a problem with all these people who look like this are the only ones who are being prosecuted this way. But then we then we have to go back to just what the, the same county that you has uh, talked about just now, and you said no Orlando, but Jacksonville. We right. got Angela Corey moved. How did we get Angela Corey moved? We had to bring in the faith leaders, the community. Now Absolutely. Angela Corey is out of, and Jacksonville is beginning to, to function and, re, uh, you know, uh, 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 rebuild. So yeah. it, it's, it's unity. How, what happened when, when that happened in Orlando? We had to stand up for our life, you know, and, and, and get this, 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 which I'm finna do uh, um, uh, accuracy and justice in our office next week too. But it, it, she's a great lady. And because she made a decision, you know, the governor tried to go at him. Everybody Absolutely. tried to go at him. But if the people in the society wouldn't have stood up beside her, then guess what? It, 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 she would have been doomed. Yeah. And that's what's gonna have to happen. Is it, what people have to understand is society is the key to all the, the 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 criminal justice reform issues we need. You know, we have to stand together, and 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 we have to understand that in this fight, it's no race, it's no race. You know, but blacks are because of their minority and poor, Sorry. but it's no race. It's gonna take us as unity to stand up as unity to make this justice system right. Right, thanks Herman. A good question that was asked and it's really kind of for both of you. And they're saying, was the story told in Just Mercy an exceptional, exceptional one, an exception, or was it really a good example of what it's like um, for someone going for the prosecution of a case? I know in terms of the prosecution, um, it's not an anomaly. It's not, it's not unknown that officers, police officers, judges won't make the decision that they need to make. The prosecutors, we talked about the evidence. So, I mean, you know, what do you, what do you both think about that? Uh, Hannah, uh, you want to go first? Well, I was just going to point to you because to answer that, I think, Herman, <laughs> forgive me for using you as an exhibit here, but what are the odds of us being able to do a webinar for the center on a movie on Brian in Alabama and tell the same story with somebody who was convicted up the road with almost the identical variables. What are the odds of us being able to say, hey, Herman, hey, you're just an hour up the road. Like you wanna do this? I think that in itself encapsulates that. But before I shut up and hand to you, there is a Brian Stevenson quote, and I don't know if he says it in the movie, it might be on one of his TED talks, but he talks about the one in 10 statistic. Right. Um, and that is for every, for, let me get it right now, for every 10 executions, one person was innocent. Innocent, right. And one of the things I loved about Brian and his TED talk when I first heard him say this, because he put it into context for me as follows. If that were true, in terms of flying and getting on a plane, for every 10 that go up, one is coming down, would you fly? Yeah, exactly. Never. And let me tell you in Florida, that statistic, when we take into the 29 figure I gave before, is one in 3.5. Wow. So I would not be on a plane. Herman. First of all, Hannah, I, I, I want to point out something. You know, we, we're throwing this number around that, Florida is leading the nation uh, um, in Deborah Alexander Reed. And you know, uh, it is a bad thing, but it, the thing about it is, I like to point out a good thing in it. You know, the good thing is about it is that 
at least we have people, and, and, and Hannah has taken part in a, a lot of this, and we have people that's here that's actually trying to go inside and find the innocent people and bring them out. So, you know, as terms to, we leading the nation in the most exoneration, we can also look at the fact that we're leading the nation of trying to get it right. We done brought the most innocent people out. So we have to also look at the good side of that at, 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 the, at the same time. As far as this movie, you know, I, it's like Hannah said, it was identical. I didn't have nothing placing me at the scene. I didn't have no evidence. Nobody said I did it. The only thing I had was a person that was, uh, in fact, the main, the main uh, suspect in the case and was believed to be actually a gunman in my case. He, after 12 years of investigation, and they saying that he, um, he said he didn't know anything about it. He finally go in the jail cell one day. I, I mean, go ahead, he finally go in the cell one day after the detective came, and the detective, I guess him and the detective worked the deal out to get some time cut off, and he finally made up a story saying I confessed to him in a, a jail cell. You know, so it's 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 it's, it's basically identical. But what we got to look at is that this, regardless the, the, the identicalness in, in my case or not, we got a case like Seth Penelope. Seth Penelope went through three trials, three trials, $18 million trials. That's what his total trials got. To find out that, you know, he wasn't the person, you know, for his exoneration. We have a police officer, uh, Run Wright. You know, he went through it, and then they found out he was, and, and, and it's all different circumstances that of under these exonerations that's actually coming out. There's so many different uh, 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 reasons withholding evidence, DNA, you know, for instance, you know, uh, 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 recanting statements and things like that. You know, my case became the first case in history where all seven judges of Florida Supreme Court ruled I shouldn't have never even been uh, convicted. So that's an outstanding mark. But this, this, these cases are happening right here in your, your backyard. You know, my case, self another case came out of Broward County. We got uh, Frank Lee Smith and um, a couple more uh, out of Dade County. You know, we, 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 this is happening everywhere around us that these exonerations, but we, we, let's, let's, when we talk about exoneration, Let's bring it to a, a, a bigger number now. I'm going to take it to a bigger number now. And we talk about South Florida. We're going to take it to a bigger number. A bigger number when I say exoneration, we have so many that are not death penalty cases that is exonerated now. Mm -hmm. So many that is not death penalty cases exonerated, but they're not holding that number and they're not letting us know that number. Then you got to think about the numbers of here when people are sentenced to death and it's commuted down to a life sentence or they right, didn't get right. a plea bargain. You know, all those are cases where the prosecutors got it wrong. Yeah. Our justice system got it wrong. So now, you know, when we talk about this movie, you have to understand that movie is not such a unique story. It's a story that goes on and on and on and it's continuing to go on until we find a solution to the mountain, you know, but what we have to understand is that that movie, because of the actors, because of, you know, the, the people involved, it was able to reach people that normal people couldn't reach. For instance, here we are, Hannah and Miss uh, Petit is, is, is up on this panel, and Michelle, we, we're on this panel, but we only reaching a small section of, of, of people uh, that's attending. The movie was able to bring out and reach into the legislations and other people, and people want to see it because they want to see how fine Jamie Foxx is or how beautiful Brie Larson is. And, and that what like that, the story. Right, and that is what, what had to be done to actually grasp this criminal justice uh, reform thing that we, we're so hard fighting on. I mean, I'm like Hannah and, and Miss Phyllis, we've been fighting for years. Yeah. But this movie opened the doors to, to get us into the minds that we couldn't reach before we couldn't have the legislation entertain anything about the death penalty. 
Now they're introducing laws to abolish it or laws to take away the mechanism. You got the, the, the uh, governor of California did a moratorium, you know, and these things, if you notice, happen after the movie. And this movie is something that's going to go down in history mm -hmm. as a way that opened the doors to the communities that we needed to reach, the people in society that we needed to reach to actually change the criminal justice reform uh, matter that we have. So there are two, two important issues that we've not touched on a whole lot, and I want to make sure we don't miss with one. Um, but let's talk about race, because that's a couple of questions that's come up. And people want to know, you know, what are the percentages, you know, white versus non-white when we look at, at death row? Um, I, I know that Florida was one of the, was the test case for putting a juvenile on death row, for putting a mentally ill person on death row. I mean, you know, so what are the numbers, if you have any, Hannah, uh, for, for white, non-white, and, and the, the impact of race when we look at the imposition of the death penalty? Yeah, well, a couple, a couple of stats uh, for you. Um, so according to Death Penalty Information Center um, and a report that I'm looking at that's actually, I believe it's dated 2018. Um, in terms of death row, because I know we had a question in particular numbers of death row and races, we have 42% black and 42% white, which is very interesting. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about is the Boulder study, which is, um, sadly, he, he died just recently, David Baldus, um, and he was uh, an indirect colleague of mine because he did so much work with the folks such as Amicus and bunches of lawyers looking at his. He was a um, social scientist. Um, he did many a study over the years, but the ones that became famous were in the 90s. Um, and indeed, just before he passed, he was working on updates of this. So we can expect to see more coming very soon because people are finishing his work. But the current running stats of that research indicate that if you are a black male convicted of killing a white, Actually, I don't know for, for gender on that, female or, right. or male, but a black person convicted of killing a white person, you are three times more likely to be sentenced to death than the other way around. And then another stat that I wanted to point out just to bring us to Florida. Um, what, what, we're running race stats now, but I can't tell you what is statistically significant just yet until those models have been done. So watch this space for Florida. But what I will say, which I think is very significant, is that the first execution of a white man for killing a black man occurred in 2017. That's right. And I think that was a very deliberate selection to try to show us that Florida is not racist suddenly in terms of its executing history. Of course, I, that's my opinion on that, uh, but that is a pretty staggering statistic that Florida until 2017 had never executed a white person for a, with a black victim. So I think when we talk about race, Yes, we're talking about those who are convicted and are in the defendant role, but we are also talking about the value of life for those who are the victims and what the system is saying about that. So Herman, if you had to say something to a law student right now, I have some law students listening and they're like, well, what should I be doing? What do I need to know? Why does this matter for me? So these are people that are just going to be entering the legal profession. Okay, I'm gonna use the movie for example. We had three characters. We had Walter, who was a hardworking man. We had Herb, who was uh, a veteran that fought for our country, mentally uh, damaged by his participation in fighting for our country. And we had Ray, who was like a street thug. I was sort of like the street thug. We got Ryan Wright, who I talked about out of Orlando, who was exonerated. He became, I think, the 25th person, 24th person to be exonerated. 
no, 25th, Surface 24th. Uh, he was a, actually an Orlando, uh, Orange County police officer. Then we had uh, Walter, who we had Kirk Bloodworth, the direct of witness innocent. You know, he was a hard working person. Now, they did not discriminate of who they put on a, a, on death row, but they did, those were three black men that they put on death row. And where I'm going with this is that nowadays with race playing a part of it, those same three white men can be three white women, three white men, all because the legislation is becoming to use this racism as a way for election. And to me, racism is out there and it plays a, a very great part. But where do racism stop? It stops in society. And I'm a, you gotta understand, I'm strong on educating society, so I speak to society, you know, to get them to understand how important you are in this society. And these changes don't come by the faces on this panel. This, these changes come through society. The federal has stopped execution for what, 17 years, Hannah? 17 yep. years. And for the first time, what One, it was two. last week, Yep. Committed an execution. But guess who did they execute? They picked four people. White. Just out of the blue, they want, it's election time. Let's pick four white people that's not up for death, uh, for execution right now. Let's pick these four. And some of, uh, I think three of them was tied in with the white supremacists when they was younger. And let's execute these people to show them that we're not going to tolerate racism. But in actual reality, that was a racism act. And the racism act was, was actually acted because they won't help with votes. They want to be voted in. And see, that's where society come in and those that's listening come in when you vote. Look at the actions of the people that's voting. Are you voting for? Vote for the people that will help eliminate this racism. That is not, you know, racism is not just pointed at blacks. Racism is pointed in, 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 in many different ways, in many different uh, 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 colors. So to get out of this, I mean, society, those that's listening, educate all the other ones, Every one of your friends, you know, tell them about the great panel you you listening to. Whatever you have to do, show some of the examples that we didn't show. Hannah didn't show the graph and everything. The judge just spoke about thing. Share it. Educate people. Vote to eliminate this racism. I was listening on the radio the other day, and I heard the guy running for mayor in Miami. He was talking about how he's gonna make sure. You remove racism and this and that, but you was already in office. So why are you using this slogan now? So society got to have the, we, let me stop saying society because I am part of society. We have to join the forces together and hold these people accountable and sit there and make sure that they are doing what they need to do. Not using this racism stirring it up in the community to get votes. We have to let them know, say, hold on, wait a minute, stop. We are standing here as equal. We are standing here as not just white, black, Puerto Rican, uh, Cuban. We're standing here as one individuals all together as Americans, and we will not tolerate this, this racist juries. We're not gonna tolerate this racist selecting of who you give the death penalty to, uh, who you selecting to execute in our name. Because one of the first days of my life that I would never 
never forget. And that's the day I was sentenced. And that's the day when the judge said, we, the people of the state of Florida, here about now, sentence you to die by lethal injection. Out of everything that, I, I, everything that happened to me, I would never forget those words. And what those words are saying is that it's the people of the state of Florida that they're doing this on. Now we got to stand up and say, hold on, you're doing this in our name, and this is not what we want. We want change. We want this. So we have to stop it and take out the racism out of this. And that's the only way we're going to do it. That brings us up to this third poll question, Herman, thank you, that I, that I think is so powerful. Uh, it says, a person, poll three, a person cannot be sentenced to death without a jury of 12 agreeing. True or false? So Hannah, we have law students in here asking how they can get involved. So I want to make sure we, we hit those things as well. I mean, other people asking Herman, what should they be doing if they are not, you know, if, if they don't know? And, and you've told them a, a lot of it in terms of voting. And that was the next point. How are we doing on our um, poll? Well, uh, wonderful. Uh, we still have a lot of participation here. So I'm about to close it and share the results with everybody. Ooh. Wow. How, how, Nick, race. Um, the answer. Uh, well, technically true right. as of in Florida 2017 because of our current Florida statute, which was changed then as a result of all the legal chaos I referred to before. But for those sat on death row, over a third of them have been convicted and sentenced to death either by a jury panel and decision of less than a 12-0 vote or because the judge decided to override the jury's decision of life. And you see that mentioned in the Just Mercy movie too. That I was going to say that's what happened in Just Mercy, that the the jury had sentenced him to life, but the judge decided to override that. Yeah. And so I, I think that that's important to point out that now, yes, but people are still <laughs> sat on death row and will not get relief, will get, not get a new trial. The court has said no. And to a bunch of people who fall into a particular category, they have indicated they may get um, a new uh, resentencing, but unfortunately the newly composed court has just walked that back and have said the death penalty statute as it currently is goes above and beyond what the Constitution requires. So the current Florida Supreme Court just ruled just earlier this year that you do not need a 12-0 decision to sentence somebody to death, which is also the power of politics. Right. You know, one of the, one of the uh, sayings or one of the quotes from, from Brian Stevenson, it says, fear and anger are a threat to justice because they can affect a community, a state, or a nation and make us blind, irrational, and dangerous. And one of the things you, I thought you could see throughout the movie was the fear of people who are elected or appointed to do a job to do their job. I mean, the judge was given the information. Think about the panel of appellate judges that got the information and how many times this case went to an appellate court for appellate judges to say, well, affirm or send it back for another procedural or technical reason because no one wanted to deal with the, um, the everyone was afraid, the fear of, of saying, I'm the person that released the person. And, and what I don't get and, and what I'd like to, for us to talk about is what what merit is there in convicting an innocent person? So do you think these people convince themselves that they have the right people? You think they don't care? I mean, what do you think is really at play when we watch, watch it in action? And, and I can tell you, I was a former prosecutor. I don't get it. I would get no, no pride out of convicting an innocent person. So I, I don't understand it. 
I, I would like to uh, reply to some of that. And, and you know, the, the thing about it is that um, it, it, with your experience in the courtroom, I think you can follow me. A lot of students may not know what it is like in the courtroom. I learned the hard way through trial, but it goes back to what we was talking about, about the evidence, you know, in the story. You know, uh, prosecutors also, as much as I hate to I have to defend them on this, uh, uh, prosecutors also have to rely on detectives, yeah. paperwork, investigation, and they have to bring that picture into court and seek uh, uh, justice. Now, if a prosecutor sees something and it is, it's, it's, it looks like everything is concrete there, and they're trusting this officer, and you know they're trusting this report, and they seek justice. You know, sometimes you can't blame them, but when they know that things aren't right and things are wrong, that's a totally different ball game, and yeah. they continue to 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 pursue at it. You know, it, it was mixed. I think my prosecutor had the hardest time. In fact, he 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 quit after my case was uh, overturned and became the defense attorney. Um, but, you know, Interesting. At, the beginning, oh. <laughs> at the beginning, uh, I still wouldn't get him as a defense attorney. But, <laughs> okay, I won't ask his name then. <laughs> but it is a matter of record. Yeah, I try to spare him. But the thing about it is that when we was in trial and we was going through trial, they gave me an opportunity to see it. the prosecutor had a different perspective you know, me and him used to talk and things like that. And that's unusual. You know, most people, most state attorneys don't um, go and say, how you doing today and things like that. Oh, we can't discuss the case, but you know, how you doing and things like that. But uh, we had developed, a, you know, we say nice things to each other. We didn't have no hard on against each other. And at the beginning of trial, uh, I mean, at the beginning of trial, when we were picking the jury, when he offered me three years in exchange for a manslaughter, wow. one of the reasons, he did that is because he said he kept arguing with Michael Sachs and Michael Sachs won't let him let this case go. His boss won't, his boss is like, go for it. He was like, let's give him a plea deal or something. He was like, no, go for it, go for it. So when he gave me the plea deal, he made it clear that his boss, you're gonna get mad, but hey, you don't want this case to go to the, the Florida Supreme Court, you know, this and that. So he was like, um, let's, Let's uh, compromise here and give three years. Uh, uh, what you call it? So that shows that the prosecutor has discretion. But you also look at look at the, the assistant prosecutors only have so much power when right. the, the, the head uh, state attorney, who most likely is not prosecuting cases. Right. So you know he's pushing them, pushing them towards it. And we've done A and J's with state attorneys. You know uh, that pushes there, uh, 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 questions came up, what do we do when our boss want us to pursue this case, but we just know and feel that something ain't right. You know, it's our job, you know. So, you know, it's, it's we, when we talk about the prosecutor, we got to look at like, like all forms of, of the problems in, the, in, the, in that department. Yeah, true. And that brings us to our, our last poll, and then I, I, I want to let you all have the closing remarks here. Um, and it's a person cannot be sentenced to death if they did not actually kill and intend to kill another human. Again, we're getting a lot of uh, great participation. Uh, once again, I, I appreciate it. I know our panelists do as well. I'll go to about 10 more seconds before I'll, cl I'll close this final poll. I'll... Uh... I'll go ahead and, and answer this. And I suppose I should have added um, in Florida uh, to right. be, be precise mm -hmm. and in the United States, because uh, you certainly can for other reasons. I can say that 76% um, of you are incorrect. Uh, I'm going to explain that. Um, 
You are only death eligible if you are convicted of first degree premeditated murder in Florida. But as part of that definition of murder one is felony murder. What do we mean by that? It's a, it's a legal doctrine, a felony murder rule, which allows you essentially to broaden, to include murder for accomplices. Uh, so let me give you an example. Um, two brothers go in to rob a gas station. Uh, whilst they're doing so, um, one brother shoots and unfortunately kills the store clerk. Uh, brother who did not do the shooting, did not participate in it, but did participate in the robbery, is also eligible for the death penalty. I don't have the stats for you on how many, we call them non-trigger men, right. um, there are on Florida, but I will soon. So with that, um, I certainly want to thank everyone. I want to give both Hannah and Herman an opportunity for we're about at a minute closing for each of you at this point, you know, um, and I, this closing with another quote from Brian Stevenson, he was saying, we're all implicated when we allow other people to be mistreated. Uh, an absence of compassion can corrupt the decency of a community and of a nation. Um, Hannah and Herman, in terms of your closing remarks. Herman, shall I, I'll go, I'll go first, save the best to last. Absolutely. Um, so my one minute closing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use to address the reoccurring questions that we, we didn't nail really in my answers yet so far, which is what, pe what can people do uh, aside from voting? What else can be done? Uh, first of all, you don't need to be a lawyer. I think Herman has made that very clear to be doing something about this. Um, you can be from any field, discipline, walks of life. If you are interested in this, uh, please do send me an email, come see me, and we can talk more if I don't give you a good enough answer in this minute. Uh, but you can come and volunteer for us at the center. Do you have to be a lawyer? No. In fact, most of my interns right now, we have a wonderful team and I can't name you all, but they're all present here, um, are of a psychology background, but you don't need to be. <laughs> you don't need to be at FIU enrolled either to volunteer. We have also over 300 lawyers, pro bono lawyers from all over the world helping us do the empirical research. So a massive thank you to the volunteers. If you wanna be with one of those, let me know and we can talk about it. But also, even if there isn't a project or something that I'm doing, you may have something, an idea that you wanna follow through and do something about. And I wanna hear about that. And I know Herman does, I know FIU does, because we wanna help people and empower you to do what you wanna do about the issues. So I'm gonna leave you with my favorite quote from Brian. Justice comes when the ideas in your mind have the convictions of your heart. So if you have those ideas and your heart is pursuing you, please let us know and shout loud because we're going to embrace it and run with you. It would be an honor. So thank you for joining. Thank you. Herman. I just want to leave with a thank you. Uh, I, even though I, I can't see your faces and I'm not speaking in front of everyone, you know, it's, it's great to know that you, you take an interest in these matters and willing to participate. And I hope that after this is not have your interest and then you just walk away and do nothing. You know, even that you could do the simplest thing is talk to a friend about the issue. You know, the more you spread the issue, the better it, it helps us, the more strengthened we get. You know, I want to thank the, the, the Dean for having us here at FIU. And as, as Pana said, you don't have to be a, a attorney to, to be a part of it. You know, I'm not an attorney. You know, I'm a death row exoneree and the same people that I can't get a job at, out in the community, at least FIU accepted me to help them with this program. And the thing about that is that we are making progress and the way we're making progress is because we have people such as yourself involved. You're making movement for us. You know, as I said before, we may be the picture up on this panel, but the power and the, and the movement and the results are coming through the people that are actually attending and taking interest. And the more people we get in, uh, taking interest in it, the better things it is for us. 
as far as uh, like Hannah said, you might have an idea. You know, FIU may not offer something that if I you don't offer you something that uh, fits your idea, understand that I'm a part of a, a many many different organizations that I can talk to and relay. You talk with Hannah, and you may want to do a, a project on the death penalty or something, and that one of our organizations can put an event for you together at your church or your school or something like that. So you, we 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 we're reaching out broad and. Another thing is that is how we're able to reach out so far and so distance is because the more that's joining us, the more ability we have. Absolutely. And if they're FIU law students, you should know that I'm director of our pro bono and all of our FIU students have a mandatory pro bono requirement and getting involved on any level would qualify you to receive pro bono credit and receive our pro bono medal um, with work that you do when it's over and above the minimum. Uh, so Michelle, I guess it goes back to you or back to the Dean. We thank you for this opportunity and thank you for this thank chance you. to present um, important information. Dean, did you have anything in your closing remarks before I close everything out? Uh, no, simply I thought that was fascinating and I'd like to thank once again the panelists and uh, of course Judge Cote. Excellent and I would again like to thank our audience and our panelists for tonight's impactful conversation on racism in the U.S. criminal justice system. We will email you when the on-demand recording is available along with answers to the unanswered questions that we didn't get to tonight. If you have any additional questions for our panelists or the work the FCCR does, please email Hannah Gorman at hgorman at fiu.edu. Everyone has a wonderful evening.